Hello and welcome to this session. Uh, today we are going to uh, be continuing with our pharmacology series. Uh, remember in our previous class we looked at the different categories of drugs and uh, one of it was anti-infectives. Uh, anti-infective are simply medications that are used to treat various infections. Could be bacteria, uh, virus, fungi, rickettsia, parasites, and so on and so forth. But today we'll be specifically looking at antibiotics. And um, antibiotics are a class of medication that will be used to treat specifically bacterial infections. They have two major mode of action. They can either be bactericidal or bacteriostatic. Bactericidal in that these are a type of antibiotics that are going to kill the bacteria directly. And good examples here could include penicillins and amino glycosides. On the other hand, we have bacteriostatic. Bacteriostatics do work by inhibiting the growth and reproduction of bacteria. And this one allows the immune system to be able to eliminate such microbes. Good examples will include the versatile tetracyclines and the macro, macrolides. All right. So antibiotics do not have an effect on viral infection. And this is very key for us to note. So they are specific to bacteria. We only use them to treat bacterial infections. Antibiotics work by targeting specific aspects uh, of bacterial physiology. Uh, it could be the cell wall synthesis. It could be the protein synthesis process, DNA replication, and other essential bacterial processes. So we have um, the other concept of the spectrum of activity, and this simply refers to the range of bacteria against which a particular antibiotics will be more effective. So in this case, we have two uh, uh, levels where we have the broad spectrum antibiotics and the narrow spectrum antibiotics. So the broad spectrum antibiotics, these one are normally effective against a wide range of bacteria. It could be gram positive or gram negative, while the narrow spectrum uh, spectrum antibiotics, these ones are normally effective against specific types of bacteria. So we are also going to classify our antibiotics uh, using the spectrum of activity. In doing so, we are going to encounter this concept of selective toxicity, where um, we, we are going to see that uh, antibiotics are normally designed so that they can selectively be toxic to bacteria. And and this one helps to minimize harm to the host cells okay so we'll be having the the trough the trough levels of a drug and the peak levels of a drug so the trough levels of a drugs these are the the, the the minimal level of a drug in, in the body and this is specifically taken before administration of another drug and this is just to ensure that we are able to um, conserve that amount of a drug that is able to be effective against eliminating these microbes. Peak levels will be important and this one will be helping us so as to try to avoid the side effects or unwanted effects of a drug. So selective toxicity, uh, this selectivity is, ach is normally achieved by targeting bacterial structures or, or functions and not present. These structures will not be present in the human cells. So from there, we look at antibiotic uh, resistance. And this is a topic that we'll be ending this session with. But for now, we can say that uh, this one emanates from the overuse or the misuse of antibiotics that can lead to development of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, which has become a global concern. So our role as healthcare providers is for the uh, antibiotic stewardship, where we are advocating for the compartment of this problem, because it's going to really affect not only the client, but us as healthcare providers. In doing also so about the antibiotics, it's good for us to look at the life cycle of bacteria. And you know, the life cycle is very relevant. So as it, because this will help us understand how antibiotics work and when they are most effective. So the life cycle generally involves several stages and antibiotics do targets 
uh, specific processes within this cycle. The first uh, uh, cycle or the stage is the colonization. And this you find that bacteria will begin their life cycle by colonizing a suitable environment. E.g. could be a host organism or a surface. So from there, they undergo growth and development uh, where bacteria will grow and will reproduce through this binary fission, a process where a single bacterial cell divides into two identical daughter cells. And this offers a better target for us to uh, aim at this process so that we can um, terminate the multiplication of the bacteria. Another key process is protein synthesis. You know, bacteria continuously synthesize proteins so as to carry out essential functions for their survival and reproduction. So antibiotics can target this process and we have examples like aminoglycosides, the microliths, the tetracyclines. They do interfere with this process. Next, we have the cell wall synthesis. And in cell wall synthesis, you find that bacteria, they have a cell wall that is made up of the peptidoglycan. So this one provides a structural support. So antibiotics such as the penicillin, the cephalosporins, they do target the synthesis of the cell wall. Okay, so when they do that, they normally disrupt the integrity of this bacteria and they lead to the lysis of the bacterial cell. We also have the DNA replication. Remember before cell division, bacteria will have to replicate their DNA. So we have antibiotics that do target this stage and uh, good examples will involve the fluoroquinolones, which do interfere with the DNA replication by inhibiting enzymes that are involved in this process. Another key concept is the folic acid synthesis. Yeah, we all know that folic acid is very essential for bacterial growth. So also we can also manipulate this stage where we have antibiotics such as the sulfonamides and the trimethoprane. Do inhibit the synthesis of the folic acid. So this one will end up disrupting the bacterial metabolism. On the exponential growth and population increase, bacteria in their right conditions, they can undergo exponential growth and rapidly increasing their population, which also offers another target point. On the infection and diseases, if a bacteria colonizes a host organism and overcomes its um, defenses, an infection can develop, we can try to prevent using the prophylactic uh, antibiotics or the vaccination for that matter or the prophylaxis in that case. Antibiotics are often used to treat bacterial infections by targeting specific bacterial uh, processes. We have the immune response where the host immune response will play a crucial role in compacting bacterial infection, where we normally have the neutrophils in acute in, uh, inflammation and macrophages for the chronic inflammation. The other types of white blood cells also play a role in, in case of an infections. So antibiotics can assist in the immune system by reducing the bacterial load and allows the immune cell to eliminate the remaining bacteria more effectively. So we have um, uh, some targets for the different antibiotics. You can see the cell wall synthesis, the cell wall synthesis, or you have the beta-lactams, okay, penicillin, cephalosporins, carbonepams, and monobactams. We also have the vancomycin, okay, uh, vancomycin, these are the glycopeptides. We'll be looking at it, like the pacitracine. We also have the cell wall, cell membrane synthesis, and a good example of antibiotics, we're going to be having the polymexins. Um, then we could uh, get to the we could get to the folic synthesis, okay? We can block the, the, the process of folate synthesis used by use of the sulfonamides and trimethoprene. We could also uh, block the process of protein synthesis, okay, uh, by using the tetracycline, aminoglycosides, and microlids. We could all block the DNA formation by using the DNA generase. These are the quinolones, all right? Okay, guys, so we have uh, 
over 14 examples or groups of antibiotics guys a link on the 14 types of antibiotics will be popping up you can review and see the list of all the 14 groups of antibiotics for the purposes of this lecture guys we'll be looking at this eight and thereafter we'll be also looking at the other seven to make uh, up the whole total so examples and the most common one could have penicillins amoxicillin is the best example here guys or ambicillin and they just work by inhibiting uh, bacterial cell wall synthesis cephalosporins like ceftriaxone which is a third generation guys and uh, it has the same mechanism like the cephalo the, like the penicillins we have aminoglycosides a good example is the gentamicin topramycin and they do work by inhibiting protein synthesis another type of bacteria that works by inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis is the microlides and te tetracyclines all right also we also have another group of antibiotics that they work by inhibiting bacterial dna synthesis and good examples could include the fluoroquinolones like the ciprofloxacin levofloxacin one again next we have also another type of antibiotics that do work by inhibit, inhibiting bacterial uh, folic acid synthesis like the sulfonamides a good example is trimethoprim sulfamazoxazole right then we have the glycopeptides that do work like the penicillins all right we can um, of course i can remind you about the broader group we have the beta lactam that do work by inhibiting um cell wall synthesis all right so we have penicillins we have cephalosporins we have the capanempans and the monobactams we have four groups okay pccm all right, so um, uh, penicillins, they do work by inhibiting cell wall synthesis by binding to these penicillin binding proteins that are found on the bacteria. And this one prevents peptidoglycan cross-linking. Uh, cephalosporins are going to bind also to the uh, penicillin binding proteins. Uh, Carbanepams, they inhibit cell wall synthesis by resampling the penicillins and cephalosporins, whereas the monobactams, they inhibit cell wall synthesis by binding to these penicillin binding proteins with a unique structure compared to these other beta lactams, guys. Okay, also beta lactams is a broad category. We have penicillins under it, and uh, we have different types of penicillins, like natural penicillin, examples penicillin G and penicillin V. Uh, these are effective against a range of gram positive bacteria. We have amino penicillins, like amoxicillin, ampicillin. This is an extended spectrum, and it works against uh, some negative, gram negative bacteria, and is commonly used for respiratory and and urinary tract infections. We also have the anti-staphylococcal penicillins like the methicillin. These are resistant, uh, resistant to beta-lactamase enzymes often used for staphylococcus aureus infection. Extended penis, uh, spectrum penicillins like the pirapiricillins or the ticacillin, these are extended spectrum okay and then lastly we have the beta lactamase inhibitor combinations like which one guys augmentin augmentin is simply the amoxy amoxicillin plus the clavulinic acid so they normally include a penicillin and a beta lactamase inhibitor extending its effectiveness against beta lactamase producing bacteria so um penicillins uh we need to confirm the sensitivity of this target bacteria to penicillin through culture and sensitivity testing wherever possible so this normally helps in selecting the most appropriate antibiotics for the specific infections so we need also to assess the allergies of the patient's history for any non allergies to penicillins or other beta lactamase uh, antibiotics penicillin allergies could range from just mild rashes to severe life-threatening condition like anaphylaxis 
there is also that cross reactivity with cephalosporins yeah, it may occur so we need to evaluate the patient's response carefully um, on the penicillins are primarily excreted through the kidneys so renal function has to be on the maximum point and we have to adjust dosage when uh, possible when if patients are having renal impairment just to prevent toxicity you need to administer penicillin according to the recommended dose and say schedule and you need to take into account uh, for severity of the infections patient's age uh, weight and um, overall health in some cases penicillin may be used in combination with other antibiotics because uh, especially in the treatment of severe infections where broad spectrum uh, coverage is needed in pregnancy, you need to consider the potential benefits and risk when prescribing penicillin to pregnant or breastfeeding mothers. So you find that in many cases, penicillin are generally considered safe, but if in one or two cases, you might have individual circumstances, which may vary, and it means we have to be keen with this. You also need to be aware of potential drug interactions, especially with medications that may affect renal functions, since we have said that uh, they are primarily excreted through the renal. We also need to be vigilant about antibiotic resistance, so overuse or misuse of penicillin could contribute to this problem, so we need to use antibiotics judiciously to preserve, uh, to preserve their efficacy. Also, we need to monitor patients for signs of therapeutic efficacy, such as resolution of symptoms and improvement in laboratory parameters. Monitor for potential adverse effects, including allergic reactions and gastrointestinal disturbances. Then you need to educate patients on the importance of completing the full dose, even if the symptoms improve before the medication is finished. Be able to emphasize on the risk of potential resistance associated with incomplete causes. Number two, you have cephalosporins, and these are a class of broad spectrum antibiotics that are widely used to treat bacterial infections. They belong to the beta lactam group of antibiotics, so they do share similarities with penicillin in their chemical structure. Cephalosporins were originally derived from a fungus called the acromonium and they have been developed into multiple generations with improvements in spectrum and resistance against beta lactamases. Uh, we cephalosporins are divided into several generations based on their chronological development. So each generation has a different spectra of activity against bacteria. Uh, in terms when you look at them, their mode of mechanisms, uh, just like uh, the penicillins, cephalosporins do exert the antibacterial e e effects by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. They do bind to the penicillin binding proteins um, and this one normally disrupt the cross-linking of peptidoglycan in the bacterial cell wall. All right. So if you look at their spectrum of activity, cephalosporins are broad spectrum. So they work against gram-positive. They also work against gram-negative. However, their effectiveness against uh, specific bacteria may vary among different generations. I, uh, some, bac some bacteria may produce enzymes such as lactamases that can break down cephalosporins and render them ineffective. So certain cephalosporins, especially later generations, are more resistant to these enzymes. Cephalosporins are generally used to treat a wide range of uh, bacterial infections, including respiratory infections, skin, soft tissue infections, urinary tract infections, and many more. There is this cross reactivity with penicillins, and we just mentioned it when you are dealing with penicillins. Uh, if I saw this cross uh, reactivity with penicillin may occur in individuals with uh, penicillin allergies. However, the risk is generally lower compared to other beta lactam antibiotics. Cephalosporins are available in various formulations, including oral and injectables. So the choice depends on the severity of infections and the patient's ability to take oral medications. Currently, we have uh, up to five generations. So the first generation could have examples like cephalexin, which are primarily uh, against gram-positive bacteria. Second generation, like the uh, cefoxetine, and these are broader spectrum antibiotics. It includes some gram-negative uh, coverage. 
Third generation, uh, the most notorious drug used here, we have ceftriaxone, and it's effective against gram-negative, including Pseudomonas uh, aurigelia, okay? Could use the ceftaxidine, okay? We also have the fourth generation, uh, the cefipimine, and uh, it's a broad spectrum uh, antibiotics with enhanced activity against gram negative, okay, and some extended spectrum lactamase, right. Then the fifth generation we have the ceftriaxone, and these are broader spectrum including activity against methicillin resistant staphylo staphylococcus. Next, we have aminoglycosides, and this is the third group of antibiotics, okay? And these are antibiotics effective against gram, uh, a wide range of gram-negative bacteria. Aminoglycosides are often used in combination with other drugs. This is just for synergistic effects. So their use requires close monitoring due to their potential side effects, including kidney and ear toxicity. So they work by binding to the 30S subunit of ba uh, bacterial ribosome. So you find that this binding normally interferes with the initiation complex formation. So this leads to misreading of the messenger RNA and the incorporation of incorrect amino acids in the growing peptide. As a result, uh, the production of faulty proteins, which normally result to bacterial death. Uh, examples could include streptomycin, uh, where do we meet streptomycin most of the times? Yes, in treatment of tuberculosis. Uh, we have gentamicin, and this is also broad. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic, uh, mostly used in urinary tract infections and respiratory infection. We also have the tobramycin. Uh, this one is used in treatment of respiratory infection, especially patients suffering from cystic fibrosis. Amikacin is reserved for treatment of infections caused by multidrug bacteria. Neomycin, a, uh, this one is, is a topical uh, formulation, uh, okay, used to prevent and treat skin infections. So you could find that aminoglycosides could um, predispose someone to kidney toxicity, nephrotoxicity, autotoxicity, neuromuscular blockage, and some allergic allergic reactions. We also have hematological effects where we have neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and coagulation abnormalities, together with the GI disturbances, neurotoxicity, liver elevated, uh, liver enzymes abnormalities, and super infections with the Clostridium difficile. And this one is where you need to put your patients on contact precautions. Micronids is the fourth one, and these are broad spectrum um, uh, act activity against gram-positive bacteria and some gram-negative. They are used in treatment of respiratory infections. Okay, we have the skin and soft tissue infections. They are often chosen when a patient is allergic to penicillin. So if the patient is allergic to penicillin, you, they are likely to be given the macrolids. They do work by binding to the 50S subunit of the uh, bacterial ribosome. So when this binding happens, they prevent the translocation of the transfer RNA and they inhibit the continuation of protein synthesis. So this leads to accumulation of incomplete protein chains and eventually bacterial cell, cell death. Examples could include the erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, and roxithromycin. Disturbances in GIT, uh, and this one we normally uh, encourage the patient to take the medication with food so as to alleviate such symptoms. We could have allergic reactions such as the rash, itching, swelling, severe dizziness, or difficult breathing. Also, could have liver, uh, liver enzyme abnormalities. One of the key uh, side effects that you have to know is the Tosadis D pointers. So, uh, uh, people taking microliths are likely to present with prolonged QT interval, um, especially the clarithromycin and erythromycin. So, this one, the patient, uh, you have to look at the ECG. We are going to see the prolongation of the QT interval, which could lead to a serious heart rhythm disorder, uh, the dosadis de pointes, okay? 
Remember, the risk is higher in patients with heart problems, all right? The other problems could be hearing loss, although rare and uh, it's reversible. Then you have Clostridium difficile because of the superinfection. Photosensitivity. So if patients are, uh, should be advised to take precautions when exposed to sunlight. Then you could have drug interactions. You know, microlis can interact with other medications. They may inhibit the metabolism of drugs metabolized by the liver enzyme, the CYP3F4P, potentially leading to increased levels of these drugs in the blood. Okay. The fifth one is tetracycline. And tetracycline is a broad spectrum. They inhibit protein synthesis by binding to 30 subunits. And uh, this binding interferes with the attachment of the amino, uh, am amino cell transfer RNA to the messenger RNA complex, preventing the addition of new amino acids to the growing chain. So as a result, protein synthesis will be halted, leading to the bacterial cell death. Tetracycline, as we had indicated earlier, are very versatile and they can be used to treat a variety of bacterial infections, including respiratory, skin, soft tissue, uh, certain sexually transmitted infections. However, they should be used in, with caution uh, in children and pregnant women due to their potential for causing uh, tooth uh, discoloration and inhibition of bone growth. Okay. Examples could include tetracycline, uh, doxycycline, minoxycline, and democlocycline. All right. We could also have the GIT disturbances, photosensitivity, discoloration of the teeth and enamel hypoplasia, esophageal aceration if taken with, uh, if not taken with enough water. So you have to take with enough water. Intracranial hypertension. So we could have the pseudo pseudotumor celebrity, um, where there is increased risk of intracranial hypertension, a condition that causes symptoms such as headache, visual disturbances. We could also have hepatotoxicity, renal effects, allergic reactions, and also the superinfections or by the Clostridium uh, difficile. Also, they do interact with dairy and as uh, dairy products and anti acid. So. Tetracycline can form insoluble complexes with calcium containing products like milk products. So that's why we are supposed to uh, at least avoid milk for some time during the duration when you're taking these drugs. So, uh, or these are also other, these other, um, uh, these other anti acids also. All right. Um, so we could have the chloroquinolones. And this is also another class of antibiotics. They are also broad spectrum, and they belong to the quinolone antibiotics with modification to enhance the activity. There are, of course, uh, their spectrum activity will work against this one, gram negative and gram positive, and they are effective against respiratory, urinary, gastro, and skin infections. They could be administered orally, intravenously, Occasionally topical, yeah, like with the ophthalmic and the otic formulations. We need to avoid in pregnancy and breastfeeding unless the benefits outweigh the risks. So caution in patients with history of scissors, renal impairment, or myasthenia gravis. So you need to monitor for the potential adverse effects. Okay. Respiratory infections uh, and, and this other could be the indication how they are used. You need to adjust the dose in renal uh, impairment. Also use with caution in elderly patients and uh, consideration for potential interaction with other medications. Uh, they are generally absorbed, uh, well absorbed with, when taken orally. The absorption is affected by food, so some, fluoro, some fluoroquinolones, like the ciprofloxacin, can be taken with or without food, while others like levofloxacin are usually taken without food. So fluoroquinolones have a good tissue penetration and distributed widely throughout the body, including the tissues such as the lungs, kidneys, skin, and prostate. They can also penetrate in cells, which contributes to their effectiveness against intracellular bacteria. Uh, they in exhibit uh, variable degrees of protein binding. Generally, they bind moderately to high levels of plasma proteins. 
Uh, fluoroquinolones, they do undergo minimal metabolism in the liver. Most of the drug is excreted and changed in urine, so this makes them suitable for patients with liver impairment. All right. So the primary route for elimination for fluoroquinolones, of course, is through the kidneys, and they, they, they are excreted in urine with a significant portion of the drug being uh, eliminated and changed. So dose adjustment may be necessary in patients with renal impairment to avoid accumulation and potential toxicity. Half-life of, of fluoroquinolones varies among different drugs within the class. Uh, generally, we have a relatively short half-life requiring multiple daily dosages. For example, ciprofloxacin has a shorter half-life compared to levofloxacin. Uh, renal clearance is a critical factor in uh, pharmacokinetics of fluoroquinolone, so adjustment in dosages may be necessary for patients with impaired renal functions just to prevent drug accumulation and reduce risk of adverse effects. The pharmacokinetics of fluoroquinolones can be eliminated by age and gender, for example, elderly individuals may experience changes in renal functions affecting the drug clearance. Examples of fluoroquinolones, we could have the ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, norfloxacin, and ofloxacin. All right. Um, they will have present with side effects uh, related to uh, GI disturbances, CNS or odorrhea. Uh, we also have tendon rupture and tendinopathy, all right? Um, especially when people are taking these drugs in concurrent, uh, concurrently with the corticosteroids. We have musculoskeletal disorders, uh, photosensitivity. Uh, we also have cardiac effects like the QT prolongation, and this is a characteristic they share with the microlids. Hypersensitivity reaction, hepatotoxicity, psychiatric effects, superinfections, and glucose disturbances for some of them. Uh, so next we have the sulfonamides. Sulfonamide guys, they do work by inhibiting the dehydropeptide synthase. This is an enzyme that is normally involved in bacterial synthesis of folic acid. So this disruption normally hinders the production of the nice nucleic acid, the DNA and RNA. And this leads to bacterial uh, growth inhibition. Okay, so uh, they are broad spectrum and they can, they are, uh, uh, they could be helpful in both gram positive and gram negative. Hyper resistance has developed over time and their use has diminished due to the availability of more effective and less toxic drugs. Sulfonamides can be administered orally, intravenous, or tropical for some formulation. We could also have some com uh, combined formulation, like trimethoprin as cotrimoxazole, or the TMPCMX, just to enhance antibacterial activity and to reduce the likelihood of resistance. So you could see where the sulfonamides block. Okay. Okay. Correct. In terms of pharmacokinetics, they are well absorbed when taken orally, distributed widely in the body tissues, crossing the BB and placenta, and they are metabolized in the liver and excreted in urine. Half-life varies among the different types of pharmacokinetics in this class. So the side effects we have already mentioned about hypersensitivity, hematological, renal toxicity, and so on. They are important in treatment of UTIs, respiratory, gastro, otitis, media, and eye infections. Resistance to sulfonamides has become widespread, limiting their use. So now we are doing the combination therapy just to try and counter this. Special consideration you need to give adequate fluid intakes just to prevent the formation of stones. Also cautions in patients with glucose 6-phosphatase uh, dehydrogenase deficiency due to the risk of hemo hemolysis. So avoid this drug in the last trimester of pregnancy. Examples could include the sulfamethoxazole, uh, the sulfisoxazole, the sulfadiazine, and the sulfacetamide. All right, guys. 
So yes, the cotrimoxazole, we had already mentioned it. So next we have the glycopeptides, guys. The glycopeptide, they, they work using this almost the same mechanism like the beta lactams. They, they, they do inhibit the bacterial cell wall synthesis. And this is by binding to the D-alanine, D-alanine terminus of the peptidoglycan precursors, preventing the incorporation into the growing cell wall. So this disrupts the cell wall formation and eventually leads to cell, uh, cell or bacterial death. Uh, they work, they are very active against the gram-positive bacteria, including the methicillin, staphylococcus aureus, streptococcus pneumoniae, and enterococcus species. But they are not effective against gram-negative uh, bacteria. Uh, good examples could include like the vancomycin, the tacoplanin, and the dalbavancin. All right. Um, resistance to these glyco glycopeptides, but uh, we have particularly to vancomycin as a match, and this is limiting their efficacy. This is where we have the vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Okay. On the side effects, we have the Redman syndrome, nephrotoxicity, and autotoxicity. So, Redman syndrome is particularly associated with the vanco with the vancomycin, all right, so van vancomycin, right, tacoplanin, and the dalbavancin, okay, the, those ones, so the, the two can be given, um, I, they are given IV, IV, by vancomycin, can, we can have the IV for systemic infections, and oral for gastrointestinal infections. So um, they are poorly absorbed when taken orally. That is what you need to know. Uh, it's administered uh, intravenously for systemic, uh, but we have oral vancomycin, which is sometimes used for certain bacterial infection, but its absorption is limited. So the tacoplanin and um, the, uh, and the, the, the uh, is, is also given, this one is given intravenously. And it has limited oral bioavailability, so intramuscular administration is also possible for the TACO, TACO planning. All right, guys. So, um, yes, so the half-life of vancomycin is relatively short, typically around four to, four to six hours, right? So the Redman syndrome, we have talked of the vancomycin, okay? This is just an analogic reaction that is normally characterized by flushing, airy redness, and itchiness, uh, and it's usually on the face, neck, and upper torso. And it can it can occur if the vancomycin is infused too rapidly. So the remedy is that you should have slowly infusing the vancomycin, and also administering antihistamines may help. All right, correct, guys. Yes. So we have various antibiotics that are very important to know their therapeutic ranges, guys. Okay, there are trap levels. Remember, trap levels. We are monitoring the drug to, to 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 ensure that we are not going below the effective levels of a drug. Whereas the peak levels, we are monitoring to see that we are not going towards the adverse reaction side, guys. So vancomycin, we have 20 to 15, the micro ML for serious infections. The peak levels, we have 20 to 40 MCG for complicated uh, infections. Gentamicin is also very key, peak levels of 5 to 10, micro for most infections. Ciprofloxacin, amoxicillin, ampicillin, clathromycin, okay, they are not routinely monitored, guys, okay? So dose adjustment depends on the type of infections. Topromycin is also another key where we have 5 to 10, okay? So guys, you know that gentamicin and topromycin are in the same class and they have the same therapeutic range. That is what you need to know, okay? This is what you need to get this one, okay? This is a very good fact for the NPLEX exam. So lastly about the rational use of antibiotics. We are saying that you can, you can, you can feel the importance of the antibiotics, okay? Because it's used to treat a wide range of anti uh, of, of, of biotic uh, or of bacterial infections, but you find that their effectiveness is being limited by the emergency of the resistance. 
Thus, as healthcare providers, we are encouraging the rational use of antibiotics. Rational use of antibiotics simply means appropriate and judicious use of this medication just to treat bacterial infection while minimizing the development of antibacterial resistance and reducing the risk of adverse effects. So in doing so, we have to adhere to diagnosis of bacterial infections. So we are treating bacterial infections with these antibiotics, not viral infections. Viral infections are symptomatically managed, okay? So we need a proper diagnosis based on the clinical signs and symptoms. When necessary, laboratory test is essential just to determine if antibiotics are needed. We also do targeted therapy where we prescribe antibiotics that specifically target identified bacteria. Okay, so uh, we only use broad spectrum for situations where the, the inf infecting organism is unknown, okay, or a serious life-threatening uh, infection is suspected, okay, but in most cases we'd be using narrow spectrum, which one we have identified for that particular type of infections. We're also doing the culture and sensitivity testing, okay? So we do the culture sensitivity where feasible. We obtain uh, cultures before starting antibiotics just to identify the causative factor and its susceptibility to specific antibiotics. We also have an appropriate antibiotic selection. You choose antibiotics based on the type of infections, local resistance patterns, and the patient's in, uh, individual factors, such as the allergies, age, renal function. You need to consider the least potent antibiotics that is effective for this particular type of infections. We also do the optimal dose, uh, dose and duration. You avoid unnecessary antibiotic use. Okay, you only reserve antibiotics for situations where they are truly needed. Okay, avoid use of antibiotics for viral infections such as common cold or flu. And you need to educate patients about the difference between bacterial and viral infection. Also for the preventive use, you use antibiotics prophylactically only when the benefits clearly outweigh the risk. Like for example in surgical procedures or high risk situations. Combination therapy can also help us, uh, also help us. So it may be necessary in some cases, it we should be based on the evidence and consideration of the potential effects and resistance development. We also need to do the monitoring and reassessment where we are monitor the therapeutic levels, okay, the trap and the peak levels. We do the patient educa education and we advocate for antimicrobial stewardship. So health, all health professionals should actively participate in antimicrobial stewardship program. And this is the, the uh, which the aim is usually to optimize the use of antibiotics and to improve patient outcomes and reduce resistance, guys. So this is what we really need to do for us to achieve, guys. Guys, we've looked at the eight types of antibiotics, okay? Guys, starting with penicillins, we looked at the cephalosporins, we have looked at microleads, we have looked at tetracyclines, we have looked at fluoroquinolones, we have looked at the sulfonamides and the glyco peptides. In our next session, we'll be looking at the different types of antibiotics, but this one can be found in the description section of this link, where you can also look at these other different types of antibiotics. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for being attentive throughout this session. I hope this session has been of help to you, has been informative in some ways. I want to encourage you guys to go to the description section of this link where you're going to find different quizzes for the different section of this lecture. Uh, quizzes on uh, rational use of antibiotics, quizzes on uh, penicillins, cephalosporins, tetracyclines, microleads, sulfonamides, glycopeptides, guys. You can be able to look at them and so that you can be able to test your knowledge about the understanding of these different types of antibiotics. You can challenge yourself. It's going to also reinforce your understanding of the topic and that will be so good of you guys. Guys, thank you so much. Love you. See you in the next lecture, guys. Until then, 
keep practicing bye bye